I'm Jim Grossman. I'm the Executive Director of the American Historical Association and the Chair of the Board of the National History Center, which is uh, presenting this morning's program, which is a National History Center Congressional Briefing on Commercialization of Space Travel and Human Participation in Space Exploration. This is the 10th, I believe, Congressional Briefing sponsored by the National History Center. Uh, 10 is the magic number to it was created 10 years ago by the American Historical Association. And the purpose of the center is to encourage an appreciation of history in business, government, journalism, the public at large. I think some of our materials mention academia, but if we need to promote the appreciation of history in academia, we should probably all go home. Uh, the center accomplishes this work by bringing together historians and those who work in uh, especially public policy arena, but other aspects of public culture. The congressional briefings are probably uh, the most, uh, I think, important things that we can do in this regard. Uh, there are those of us uh, who believe that an appreciation for history and understanding for history would uh, significantly improve the quality uh, and depth of policy making and policy discourse in the United States. And that's not to criticize anybody at any particular, in any particular space on the spectrum of American politics. Uh, it's basically to argue that it is impossible to either create good public policy, talk about good public policy, criticize public policy without understanding the reasons why uh, certain things are in place, without understanding the context and the significance of historical context. And in that vein, this morning, we're going to talk about NASA and space exploration. And our chair, I'm, going, I'm here to introduce our chair, who will then introduce the panel itself. Our chair is Lord Roger Launius who's the senior curator in the Division of Space History at the Smithsonian National Air and Space Museum, uh, which is, I believe, the most visited museum in the United States. We never get tired of saying that. They never get tired of saying that, so it's my obligation to, to say that, obviously. Uh, Roger graduated from Graceland College. I'll leave off the year, I think and then received his PhD in American Frontier and Military History from Louisiana State University. He's worked as a civilian historian with the U.S. Air Force uh, and as chief historian of the National Aeronautics and Space Administration until about 10 years ago, we're back to 10 again, until about 10 years ago when he joined the Smithsonian uh, as the chair of the Division of Space History uh, at the Air and Space Museum. He is the only historian whom I know of, and some of those of you who, are, who know me will know that I know many, many historians. He is the only chair of a division of space history uh, that I know about uh, in the United States or elsewhere in the world. He has written, co-written, or edited more than 20 books. I'm not going to list them, uh, but some examples, Robots in Space, Technology, Evolution, and Interplanetary Travel. Space Stations, Base Camp to the Stars, uh, Reconsidering Sputnik, 40 years since the, space, since the Soviet satellite, so that gives you a sense of the kind of work that he does. Uh, but all of that work is actually relatively insignificant uh, compared with his book published 10 years ago called Seasons in the Sun, the story of big league baseball in Missouri. Uh, it's important for us to know what really matters and what doesn't. Uh, but for the morning, we are going to assume that the history of the commercialization of space travel and human participation in space uh, is very important because it is. There is no way that we can understand the changes uh, that are right now being talked about in the American space program without understanding the past, uh, how we got here, and the basis of uh, these sorts of initiatives themselves. And I'm going to now turn this over to four people who actually know what they're talking about on this subject, which I don't. Thank you, Jim. Uh, I am Roger Lanius. I'm at the National Air and Space Museum. I hope everybody has been to my museum. 
I, have, I, ta I take a fair amount of ownership of it, although I know it belongs to the American public. Um, we have uh, three speakers today, and my task is a very simple one, is to introduce them, to keep time, and then to point to people who have questions. Uh, so uh, let me introduce our three speakers. They are each going to take five to seven minutes, and I have told them that I will hit them with a spitball or something if they go over that. Uh, so help me keep time. And uh, the first presenter is going to be Matt Hirsch. Matt is at the University of Pennsylvania. He's a recent PhD. He's a lecturer in science, technology, and society there. Uh, he has a forthcoming book, a very fine book, called Inventing the American Astronaut, which looks at astronaut and the astronaut corps in the 1960s as a labor force, which indeed they were. Um, Following Matt, Joe Tatarewicz, who is professor at uh, University of Maryland, Baltimore County, uh, is going to speak about space science. He is the author of a very fine book called Space Technology and Planetary Astronomy and is well uh, positioned to say something about the science, the history thereof, and what we might expect in the future. And then our, our final uh, presenter today is Alex McDonald, uh, who is at NASA Ames research is in which we might uh, be able to uh, pursue commercial activities in space effectively. Uh, at taking a historical perspective, he looks at uh, earlier experiences and how those might uh, translate into the space arena. So with that, let me ask Matt to uh, begin our presentations, uh, taking five to seven minutes, and, uh, and then we'll have time afterwards for discussion. Thank you very much, Roger. It's uh, certainly a pleasure to be here today. I think everyone in this room probably shares at least one belief in common, and that is that the study of history can help us better understand our present and make good choices for the future. I think it's a particularly opportune time to talk about the history of human spaceflight, because the United States is at a crossroads at this particular juncture. With the retirement of the space shuttle, the United States finds itself for the first time since 1981 without a reliable means of conveying its astronauts to and from space. Um, this is a kind of environment that the United States experienced before and I think our study of the past can help us make sense of the time that we're living in right now. I'd just like to bring out a few historical points that we might, might, might want to keep in mind uh, as we consider uh, this and other issues uh, here today. And I think the first of these is that this kind of discussion is a very, very old one because mythologies about human beings traveling into the heavens, literally, are part of just about every world culture. And they stretch back for thousands of years. And in all of these various legends and mythologies, travel into space is associated with the acquisition of tremendous amounts of knowledge and power to influence affairs on Earth. And it's probably for this reason that human spaceflight survived the end of the Cold War. We all know that superpower competition motivated the original space race of the 1960s. But we continue sending people into space because we believe that it is important. And human spaceflight has become a kind of national technical infrastructure that has national security and economic, scientific, diplomatic value. It also speaks to our most cherished notions of ourselves as a people who explore. And one wonders we can, if, whether we can remain the people that we are if we stop doing this. Um, some other th good things to keep in mind, the original space race owed a great deal to military personnel and military technology. The first astronauts were active duty military, as were the uh, rockets that sent them into space. And the early years of the space program were characterized by incremental advances and a very high degree of risk. Uh, space flight has always been a very, very dangerous business. During its peak years of operation uh, in the accelerating moon race of the 1960s, NASA lost approximately one quarter of its astronaut personnel, uh, mostly due to training accidents. Space flight isn't always dangerous, but it sort of is if you're doing it right. Um, the other thing we have to keep in mind is that human spaceflight is an extremely expensive undertaking. Um, how much did the moon landing cost? About $25 billion in 1973 dollars. This translates into about $120 billion uh, in 2010 dollars. Um, but we can't really look at that money as money down a hole. Nine out of every ten dollars that were appropriated to NASA was spent on American businesses and American universities and acted as a subsidy for the creation 
of a variety of high technology industries, particularly computing and materials. Um, this is a kind of effort that produces benefits that are often indirect and hard to see. Um, what can we say about the future of spaceflight? We're going to hear a couple of different um, visions of, uh, and answers to that particular question. Um, in terms of human spaceflight, one can argue that the only really suitable destination for NASA's explorations is perhaps Mars. Um, this is going to be probably an extremely expensive undertaking, and it's the sort of thing that should probably be conducted in cooperation with other spacefaring nations and not in competition. And there's no reason for the needless duplication of hardware, of resources, of knowledge, um, when this could be pursued as uh, a project for humanity and not merely as one single nation. The idea of international cooperation is something that speaks directly to NASA's original purpose, the discovery, the creation of knowledge for the benefit of all humankind. Something else that we might want to keep in mind uh, as we move forward is that about 100 years separated Columbus's original voyages to the New World and the establishment of the first permanent European colonies in the New World. Um, we are 50 or 60 years into uh, space exploration. While space colonization and space settlement will almost certainly happen, they probably won't happen necessarily within our generation. And they're probably not the responsibility of our current generation. But we can do things uh, to make it more likely and make it possible in the future. And with that, I'd like to conclude. Thank you very much. Good morning. It's a privilege and a pleasure to be here. I'm Joe Tatarevich, a post-Sputnik space enthusiast who turned to history and philosophy of science to understand what was happening, and I got to live my dream. Well, not the astronaut part, but the whole rest of my dream I got to live. I interned at the NASA History Office before the shuttle flew, uh, worked a decade at the National Air and Space Museum as a curator, and I now teach history of science, technology, and policy at University of Maryland, Baltimore County. Most of my uh, research and publications have been in the history and policy of space science. And I have a lot of interaction with our engineers and scientists who join our historians at UMBC in history and policy courses. We're in the midst of one of the most fractious and contested periods of space history and policy ever. Uh, the Cold War contest between the U.S. and the Soviets for hearts and minds that undergirded our space choices for most of the past 50 years is gone, and spaceflight in the United States has never really settled into a secure relationship uh, with any other broad national consensus since. Yet, past and current programs of all spacefaring nations have transformed nearly every scientific field and created new disciplines to boot. Contemporary science is infused with space, and its various research agendas presume access for the health of current and future programs. Um, persisting through these many missions and discoveries has been a vigorous and healthy community of planetary, of, I'm sorry, community of space scientists and engineers at the top of their games and immersed in research that requires getting off this planet. At the beginning, this community didn't exist. NASA primarily had to create it and sustain it in the face of early skepticism in the 50s and 60s. That community is still here and vigorous and actually um, had a uh, planetary exploration car wash and bake sale at many institutions last weekend. Um, because there's a deep institutional memory of the older days. Because after Sputnik, few scientists were willing to embrace the risks of spaceflight for their own research. To capitalize on the first results of a small coterie of pioneers, they needed more sophisticated vehicles and instruments, more sophisticated theories to integrate the new data and suggest new observations, and they needed institutions to house and train new space scientists. In short, they needed an entire system of science that didn't yet exist, one oriented toward the new and severe technical requirements of doing science in space, yet immersed in the existing scientific disciplines and their lifebloods of scientific societies, journals, university departments, courses, degrees, and textbooks. <clears throat> 
That's a vast creation of social engineering, just as complicated as the technical engineering that enables space science, and it's often overlooked. While the early leaders were excited about new opportunities for space research, they worried about sending their students into a field where the data that would sustain their careers and the science itself was unobtainable without at least transportation and often most of the overall expense subsidized by the government. These leaders foresaw a worst case scenario in which scientists found their priorities and directions suddenly distorted by non-scientific motivations and then were suddenly left high and dry when politics and policy shifted. NASA, eager to get on with scientific and other missions, devoted considerable resources to the care and feeding of this new population of scientists and their institutions from the beginning. And there are elements of a social contract there between science and government in the late 1950s, early 60s. The community growing was successful beyond belief, and the many missions, large and small, have transformed contemporary science. Scientists have integrated space-based research into most disciplines, and many fruitful new areas and directions of science have developed with access to space assumed. And uh, in the paper which uh, has been handed out, the short one, uh, I cite three examples from my own work. I'm just gonna hit those high points. Uh, first, astronomy and cosmology, the biggest questions about the universe, require access to radiation and light that does not make it through our atmosphere to the ground. You simply have to do space astronomy to do astronomy and astrophysics these days. Second, space physics, or heliospheric physics, requires that particle detectors, magnetometers, and other instruments like that be indirectly and problematically. Without space science, we'd still be trying to figure out the basic mechanism for the northern lights. And now I get coronal mass ejection alerts on my phone. Finally, uh, and what I've worked the most on, Astronomers struggled to study the planets from conventional telescopes, reaching diminishing returns by the early 20th century. Only the travels of pioneers, mariners, voyagers, and others allowed anything approaching study of other bodies in the solar system with the same detail and texture as we study our home planet. Before spaceflight, Earth science was one department, and the planets were in another department. Now, Earth and planetary sciences are effectively joined. Um, and in part, that's why there's been such distress recently over a few hundred million dollars in the Mars program while the NASA budget has survived roughly intact. I think we have a, a, a community memory and anxiety going on here about the data being yanked out from under them. Um, so my point is that this huge change in understanding our home planet and in its local and cosmic context is due to no one single mission or discovery. It arose slowly out of numerous ground and space-based observations planned and executed by a critical mass of scientists, engineers, and managers themselves healthy and self-reproducing. This massive and complex social system for doing a particular type of science more than any instrument or spacecraft, is the crowning jewel of the first half century of spaceflight. And they are out there right now watching for omens, trying to decide what to study and what to teach, and worried about the long haul resting on a fractious present. Thank you very much. Well, uh, thank you. It's a pleasure to be here. Let me start by saying that I was invited today to speak in my capacity as an academic economic historian and not in my capacity as a NASA official. And since my comments today uh, derive from my academic research, uh, nothing I say could, should be construed as representing the views of the administration or of NASA. Thank you. So how should we be thinking about commercial space flight and the private sector activity that we're seeing today in the space industry. How should we think about this within the context of our overall historical narrative of the American space program? 
I'd argue that how you think about these events is likely to be influenced in at least some degree by the time frame that you think of as con constituting American space history, by the historical context that you think is relevant for space flight. Now, the dominant narrative that we have today is one that starts in the late 1950s with Sputnik and which focuses on the Apollo program as the exemplar of American space history. This narrative is one that focuses on geopolitical competition, prestige, security concerns, and government-led space exploration. But that perspective, that narrative, is not the only one to consider. And in fact, I'd argue that that narrative actually blinds us to some of the underlying long-run historical forces that have propelled American space exploration in the past and which are driving events today. Because you can also start the story of American space exploration over 100 years before the Cold War space age and include in that history the development of the first American astronomical observatories, the first conceptual development of spaceflight by American writers in the 19th century, the first American liquid fuel rocketry efforts in the 1920s and 30s, and the first American space company founded in the 1940s. And I'd argue that if you think of American space history within that broader historical context, within what we can think of as a long space age, then a very different narrative emerges. One where for the majority of its history, Space exploration in America has been led by the private sector, and where the trend of wealthy Americans like Elon Musk, Jeff Bezos, and Robert Bigelow devoting their personal resources to the exploration of space is not a new phenomenon. It is a long-run and enduring trend which is now reasserting itself in the post-Cold War environment. I don't have time here for the short version of this history, but let me pre present three pieces of, of evidence for the relevance of this long space age perspective. The first is the economic history of American astronomical observatories from about the 1830s to World War II. During this period of time, there were dozens of large astronomical observatories that were built in the US, and with only two exceptions, they were all funded by the private sector, either by individual philanthropists or philanthropic foundations, or by civic communities eager for large telescopes and observatories in their own cities. Astronomical observatories and telescopes were the space exploration instruments of the 19th century. And what's particularly interesting is that if you, th if you calculate the modern value of the expenditures made on these instruments uh, by the individuals and private sector organizations, you find that there were over a dozen astronomical observatories that had GDP ratio equivalent expenditures of over $100 million today. Now that might not seem like much compared to NASA's overall budget, but if you look at it another way, it's roughly equivalent to the size of the personal investment that Elon Musk made to get SpaceX started, or the cost of a modest-sized robotic planetary spacecraft. And in fact, some of these astronomical observatories were closer to a billion dollars in modern GDP ratio equivalent terms. So we have well over a hundred years of precedence for large private sector expenditures on American space exploration. Now, this might seem like an unusual thing to discuss, but in fact, there is a vastly underappreciated intellectual history of space flight in 19th century America, and seriously considering the possibilities and practicalities of space flight. Edgar Allan Poe, Edward Everett Hale, and John Leonard Riddell. And to give you a sense of how impressive and serious this consideration was, let me just go into detail on one of them. Uh, Edward Everett Hale and his brother not only conceived of space flight in the 1830s, they came up with an idea for a visually based global positioning satellite system when they were both young students at Harvard. When Hale, who later became a prolific and influential writer, as well as the chaplain for the US Senate, uh, wrote a fictionalized account of the project, he imagined it would be entirely privately financed through public subscription, just like many of the astronomical observatories at the time. And he also estimated that the cost of this GPS-like system at about $370 million in current GDP ratio equivalent terms, which, all things considered, is not a bad estimate for a GPS system in the mid-19th century. Uh, there are a number of things, there are a number of these types of fascinating spaceflight thought experiments that Americans engaged in in the 19th century. Uh, there was even one book in, in 1894, which to my knowledge contained the first articulation of a public private partnership for spaceflight in the country. And what's particularly interesting is that at the time, the novelty was the public part of that partnership, since almost without exception, all the previous American conceptualizations of spaceflight had imagined the private sector developing spaceflight without any government assistance at all. So again, in the longer historical context, the private sector's role of American space exploration looks very different uh, if one thinks of space history uh, as starting in the 19th century than starting in the 1950s or 1960s. 
Okay, the third and final piece of evidence is the history of Robert Goddard and the early development of liquid fuel rocketry. Goddard's name and story is fairly well known. Uh, it's also fairly well known that his principal funder was the Guggenheim family with the support of Charles Lindbergh. The magnitude of that support is less well appreciated. Uh, again, in modern GDP racial equivalent terms, that private support was equivalent to tens of millions of dollars. And indeed, America would not see a comparable level of private investment in space launch technologies until the private space launch companies of the 1980s. And Goddard wasn't the only private sector actor in spaceflight prior to World War II. Reaction Motors Incorporated, founded in the early 1940s, was probably the first American space company founded with the explicit objective of developing spaceflight technologies. It was founded by members of the American Rocket Society, and it even received what today we would call venture capital financing from none other than Laurent Rockefeller. So I think that's about my time. But I, I hope that the evidence I've presented uh, has convinced at least some of you that what we're seeing today in terms of the development of American commercial spaceflight has long roots in this country, arguably centuries long, and that in shifting our historical perspective from one focused primarily on the Cold War space race to a broader long run view of American space history, we can see the present in a new light and perhaps even glimpse something of the future. Thank you. Okay, we have uh, heard three different presentations, each of them saying in different ways with their specific areas that we need to take a long, uh, deep uh, investigation of space history and look at it in a different way and we'll come up with different uh, approaches. Uh, I would like to now offer the opportunity for anybody in the audience to, uh, to offer uh, questions or comments on any of this. But before I, before I go there, I would like to just let the panelists, is there any rejoinder from any of you that you would wish to add at this point in time? No. Okay. All right. Any questions or comments? And if you don't have any, I will be talking. So that's always scary. Yes, Don. Can you uh, talk a little bit about what the resources are for historians studying the history? Certainly, certainly. Um, the question was about the resources for historians who want to, scar who want to uh, research into the history of space flight. Um, I spent a, uh, 12 years at NASA as the chief historian, and, and I'm most familiar with those materials, but there's obviously government uh, uh, records that are span beyond NASA, go into NOAA, the Department of Defense, a variety of other organizations that are engaged in this. Each of those uh, organizations maintain uh, some semblance of a history program, some more aggressive than others. And uh, each of them retire materials, records, and, uh, uh, and undertake oral histories that uh, mostly end up at the National Archives. Those are very uh, important resources for anybody who wishes to, uh, to undertake investigation relative to this. Beyond that, uh, there is a sponsorship from these various organizations for historical studies. And, and this happens in some cases in a very formalized manner, in some cases in a less formal manner. NASA, for instance, sponsors, and I should say that in the context of this particular briefing, an annual fellowship that is offered through the American Historical Association for historians who wish to, uh, to undertake uh, studies relative to the history of, of, of air and space. Uh, so those are some of the, uh, some of the possibilities. There is, uh, uh, beyond that, uh, less formal sorts of arrangements, internships and whatnot that, that one can tap into, as well as these materials records and hopefully insights that come from that. Um, yeah, Jim. I wonder whether the panelists could comment a little bit on what's at stake here, especially in this emphasis on um, the distinction or the relationship between the long space movement and the Cold War context. Uh, and in part, this is interesting because you see the same thing with civil rights history, uh, the distinction between the emphasis on the Cold War context for the civil, for public policy relating to civil rights in the 50s, and then historians talking about the long civil rights movement. And uh, I mean, ever since the, the quote end of the Cold War, we've seen the ways in which the Cold War put its stamp on or skewed, depending on how you want to look at it, various aspects of American public policy. And certainly, space policy has that there. So I'm just kind of curious as to what's at stake 
uh, in, this, in these different ways of looking at sort of the long history of imagination and entrepreneurship on the one hand, and that uh, jump in the graph that is due to the Cold War on the other. Who wants Sir? to? Okay. Sure. I suppose I'll start off. Let's see. Can everyone hear me? Uh, you, thank you. I think that's a very good point. Um, it's worth saying from the get-go that uh, space exploration, and in particular human space exploration, is something that Americans do extremely well. Uh, we've been remarkably successful, and have, we think we have justifiable reason to be very proud of our accomplishments. It's also true that infrastructures that are developed to do this um, are very difficult to build up again once you've gotten rid of them. Um, we uh, find ourselves often uh, in the space community wondering what might have happened if we had retained some of the assets that were developed in the Cold War that probably had a little bit more life expectancy with them with regard to their capacity to explore. Um, when we're thinking about space flight and what every presidential administration uh, since Eisenhower has thought about is the fact that this seems to be part of the American legacy and one must be careful uh, how sharply one cuts down to the bone when one is talking about reducing one's hopes and ambitions um, because uh, these are technologies that will produce their value not necessarily uh, in a year or five years or ten years even but in a generation. Um, forcing us to take a long view of where we see this technology in, uh, in our future, especially since in all kinds of ways that we can't necessarily see or appreciate, we're all almost completely dependent on technologies that involve access to space. I think we've um, lived inside the Cold War so long we can hardly think outside of it and it's going to take another generation to begin to see those structures for what they are. And some of what I see in the angst over space policy and especially space science is almost a knee-jerk reaction to a, a Cold War context. You often hear people say, gee, I wish we had another Sputnik to kick them in the pants and get us moving in a competitive way. But as we've heard, the classic American model of funding has been entrepreneurial. Um, and in a certain sense, you might look at Sputnik as having diverted the United States into a more of a government model than it might otherwise have gone in the absence of that shock, that competition, and the, the whole uh, Cold War struggle. I'm curious as to the reaction of my colleagues to that notion. I'd certainly agree. Uh, the question of what's at stake is a really, really significant and large question. Um, and I think, um, in all honesty, that what's at stake is the future of the American people in space. Um, it's a question of whether or not we're going to have a capability for the people of this country uh, without necessarily the assistance of the government to be able to actually go into space. And that is a potential future that was seen indeed uh, in the 19th century, and it was expected. Um, and the Cold War certainly changed that perspective. And what we're seeing today, I think, is a return to that view that the American people um, who have a specific, uh, well, you know, destiny um, with regard to the expansion of the solar system. Again, that is a particular perspective that some communities hold, but that's how communities move into new areas. And I think that's one of the things that's frankly at stake. Roger? Let me just add one thing to this and then I'll call on, on, on people. Um, one of the things we're kind of dancing around here is the whole issue of human spaceflight. And uh, the various missions that are undertaken in space uh, the vast majority of those are not even being questioned by anybody. We might, we might debate, uh, uh, as the scientists are doing, whether they should go to Titan or Europa or, or undertake this mission or that particular mission and on, on a particular schedule and what sensors should be on the spacecraft and things of this nature. But nobody's questioning uh, at all uh, the, the, the rationale for engaging in those kinds of activities. Um, the one area where there is that questioning is in the human side. What is the purpose of human spaceflight? And we are now at a juncture 
which we have not been at since 1972, really. A uh, little before that, perhaps. At the point that NASA uh, decided that the, that the Apollo program was going to end, that they were going to retire that technology and then seek to move on to something else. Uh, that was the other cusp in time in which those kinds of decisions had to be made. At, in, in the early 1970s, in the Nixon administration, there was no question on the part of many people inside of, uh, of the administration as well as much of the American public that we needed to engage in human spaceflight activities. It was still a part of the Cold War context. It was uh, something that we uh, had achieved a measure of pride at home and prestige abroad with. And, uh, and so we, we carried on at a level to develop a space shuttle that would replace that uh, and continue that human component. Earth orbital activities, we have now retired that shuttle and we find, I think, that there's a number of people who are asking themselves the question, what do we do now? And if you talk to people inside the space community, there's no question that we carry on. But if you talk to people on the outside of the space community, you kind of have to, you, you kind of get a sense of shrugging shoulders and saying, why are we doing this? And uh, there are not necessarily clear, rational, easily articulated, and most importantly, easily understood reasons for that. Uh, that is, I believe, the core issue today. Yes. As historians, how do you guys respond to the argument that initially the American colonies were established by private organizations and had to be taken over by the crown to gain the stability needed to later be privatized later on because it alone had all the deep pockets necessary to establish long colonies? If we are trying to have long sustainable space exploration, wouldn't we need the deep pockets of the United States government or organizations like that to create the infrastructure necessary for a long-term space, for a long-term space future? I can address that, but Alex, it's kind of in oh, your uh, goodness. strike zone. All right. Well, let's just take the Virginia colony, okay? Um, how was the Virginia colony established? Now, this is not my area of historical expertise, so anyone who actually does know a huge amount of American colonial history, please stop me. But that was actually pursued as a public-private partnership, right? The land that was granted was granted by the state, right? There was actually a royal monopoly granted to the Virginia company, right? Who then raised the funds to go and establish that colony with royal support. Now, the business plan that the Virginia Company initially had, which was to pick up gold off of the ground, um, did not ultimately come to pass, and so they ran into a number of problems. Um, but the, the notion that, that inherent in that uh, colonial movement was a public-private partnership, I think, is something to, uh, to keep in mind. It was neither solely governmental, nor was it solely private. It was inherently a partnership. Just to add to that, uh, one of the things that I think we have seen in a lot of big enterprises, uh, whether it be colonial activities in North America or other places in the world, as well as uh, in, in other entities, uh, and I can, I can point to things like uh, uh, the Transcontinental Railroad and so forth, the government is very heavily involved in that process. It may not be bringing all the money to the table. It may not be uh, the, uh, the sole... Uh, authority on any of this, but it clearly is necessary to the, uh, to the process, and it has happened over and over and over again, and I love to point to things which I know better, like, like the rise of aviation in the United States, where there is obviously a very heavy private component, but, but generally speaking, there is this uh, relationship that has existed over time in all of these entities. Let me help answer that question in one other way, too, which is that if you take your eye off of funding, what the government did at that time was establish the regulatory framework. Uh, and that's the essential part of that public-private co uh, conversation. So, for example, Virginia establishes uh, basically the basis of a slave code fairly early on. Uh, one of the things that you needed in the exploration and grant, remember the land was not the crowns to grant. Uh, 
they had to move somebody else out of that space. So there's a certain military context. So the significant part of the private-public partnership in the case you're describing is probably the regulatory frame that set, the regulatory and military frame that's set by the imperial government in London as opposed to the specific capital requirements and, and funding. So I, maybe that helps a little bit with your question. Okay, other questions in the back? Uh, I think it was two years ago or in 2009, the Chinese somewhat controlled deorbiting of one of its dormant satellites as a potential Sputnik-like event. Um, the other comment uh, is related to, I forget which one of you said, um, that uh, current generations may not be responsible for much of the uh, near-term next generation of uh, human spaceflight. So in that, in that regard, you know, historians often will look back at a block of time and it's so compressed, 100 years becomes you know, a chapter in a book. Uh, is it possible that we may, given that the relief of that, sort of taking the pressure off, uh, retooling budgets, taking some of the pressure off human beings to feel like they've always got to be uh, personally there. Um, how I relate this is uh, the development of total immersion technologies, virtual presence, um, Eventually, we may have sensor capabilities. These kind of things are being developed more in the entertainment world, but also in telemedicine, uh, remote battlefield triage-like things. Is it possible that we could reprogram budgets now to dovetail with current technologies that are uh, leading into this virtual environment um, where we could literally create uh, an absolute virtual immersion environment where humans could do spaceflight, but in a... Uh, ground-based, uh, like, unmanned vehicle environment. Uh, I mean, you can look at biofeedback uh, in uh, uh, all sorts of uh, training environments, and they, they read the same as you do if you're dealing with a critical environment in flight. So I wonder, might historians look back and eventually see a 100-year break for humans, retooling budgets, bringing them together, we focus on the commercialization, the development of new technologies to give us that edge and that feel, but then we, once we've got it right, we then do it again. Uh, in terms of human beings actually going. I realize it's blasphemous, but is there any, <laughs> any talk of a school of thought out there like that? Anybody want to respond? Yeah, I mean, there's, there's, a, there's a significant school of thought. Actually, my, um, my doctoral dissertation supervisor um, insisted that we would only explore uh, space through black clouds of sensors that would go out into the cosmos and uh, collect data and pipe that right back to us. And it's something that Fred Hoyle had talked about in the early part of the 20th century. The, what hasn't happened, though, is people have not given up that intrinsic motivation for being there. And that seems to be a very robust cultural phenomenon. Um, people want to go. And when it comes down to a question of intrinsic motivations that people have, if they have the resources to do it and are able to do it, they're probably going to go do it. And that's exactly what we've seen. This long space movement is really the product of the people who believed so fervently that they wanted to go into space, that they essentially moved heaven and earth and finance and government to make it happen. And the question is, is that cultural phenomena going to stop? And the reality is when I look around at the field today, I see that desire as strong as ever. People who are putting their own money on the line and looking to make that happen. So yes, I, I imagine some people will explore the cosmos through, through remote sensing networks and computer data. I also think some people are just going to want to go. Okay. Matt? Uh, I, oh, please, go ahead, Matt. I would just add briefly, I, I think absolutely the um, unpiloted craft are of tremendous value uh, in exploration. Uh, there is a longer term justification for human spaceflight, and that is that humanity won't survive as a single planet species, uh, in which case uh, the eventual extinction of the Earth as a habitable place for people will necessitate uh, our traveling to other places. Um, uh, as for your remark regarding the, uh, the Chinese space program, uh, it's certainly very interesting to watch whether it will be um, a, a reason for uh, increased funding or increased in interest in American human space flight. I can't say. It largely seems to be re recapitulating uh, the achievements of the Soviet space program of the 1960s, um, but it's certainly something um, very interesting to keep tabs on. Okay. Did you want to say something, Joe? Yes, very, very quickly. The um, first images I've ever seen of how people would do astronomy in space uh, from the turn of the 20th century 
um, showed a telescope sticking out of a spacecraft and an astronomer looking through it with a clipboard <laughs> and a pencil. Uh, now, that's all very quaint, but as of, I think it was 1973, as what became Hubble was being conceptualized, they anticipated returning exposed film from the telescope because there was no um, serious imaging detector capable of doing what they needed. Of course, charge-coupled devices came out of Bell Labs. Uh, things were shifted around to those, and they're in every one of our cameras now. But still, um, people would say that for the romanticism, for the public engagement and participation, um, nothing beats a human being who's at risk doing this. And I, I don't know how to assess that. Okay, other questions? Let's go over here, okay, yeah. Hi, uh, Luke Idzia, Potomac Institute for Policy Studies. Um, so the uh, Google Lunar X Prize has a component in it where the team that can image one of the uh, Apollo landing sites gets a, a bonus, a million dollars, I believe. Um, this is, you know, in line with the Lindbergh contest for uh, spurring exploration and private development. Could any of the panelists speak to uh, possibilities and ramifications within the private sector for funding historic preservation in space, not just on the lunar surface, but in orbit as well? That's a really good question. <laughs> um, I. I, the, the, the question had to do with uh, private sector funding for preservation of historic objects in space. Uh, there has been a fair amount of concern registered among the preservationists, and I, I am among them, uh, ab about as uh, one of the Google Lunar X Prize landers is successful, and one will be at some point, um, and, and will undoubtedly want to try to achieve the additional prize money associated with imaging uh, human sites on the moon, um, that they might disturb those sites. And that's, that is a major concern, and nobody uh, in the preservation world wants to see that happen. We would like to keep them as pristine as possible. Uh, there are good scientific reasons as well as technological reasons for also not to disturb them uh, for, uh, in that arena. So there's efforts to try to deal with that on the moon um, at, at, a, at, a, at a very uh, kind of uh, rules of the road, not informal manner. It's not, it, it's not one where there are laws in place or uh, there are uh, any sort of regulatory uh, uh, things that have been enacted, at least not as yet. But that is an effort that we're trying to deal with. And then there's a broader piece, uh, which is could there be private funding of these sorts of things? And presumably, I guess there could be. Uh, the question is how one would organize such an effort and what that would mean. Uh, I have no clue as to whether or not it's even doable. Anybody else want to say something? Um, you're responsible for the Viking landers on Mars. Your, your institution, as I recall, <laughs> the title was actually transferred. Yes. And I remember in the 80s, discussions with the National Park Service over whether NASA or the National Park Service should be the uh, uh, official agency for <laughs> off this planet historic preservation. <laughs> there was a report just about 10 days ago which um, recommends how far to stay away from various elements of, of various historic sites. So um, it's being worked on and it's being seriously considered. Uh, I think we should take a look at how well we um, safeguard our own material legacy uh, here on this planet uh, for cautionary uh, uh, tales about how to do it off the planet. Right. And, and, I, and I should add, uh, I've already volunteered to be the first curator on the moon. <laughs> uh, I will be glad to put up the ropes and stanchions around Tranquility Base <laughs> for all the tourists who are going to come visit. I'm being flippant here, but, but it, is, it is an issue of great concern. One of the things that we do not want to have happen uh, as has happened, say, in Antarctica, where uh, Scott's hut was pilfered, and uh, a variety of things like that might happen as there is more capability to reach these sites on the moon in the future, and we want to try to set up a, an environment whereby as much is preserved as possible. Okay, uh, we'll go to the gentleman here. I was wondering, uh, you mentioned, this is mostly to Mr. McDonald and Mr. Tatarowitz, um, Space exploration in the early uh, 20th century with uh, people like uh, 
Carnegie and et cetera as the funders. They were, were they looking for profit or for the exploration side? Because the way I see it, current, current entrepreneurs like uh, Elon Musk uh, and SpaceX, uh, Orbital Sciences, um, they're all providing services for paying customers. Um, or if you look at the tourist side, uh, Virgin Galactic, uh, Sierra Nevada, um, th those are services and they hope to eventually generate a profit. Do you think that the government and NASA can leverage private companies to do exploration side uh, of the picture? Thanks. Well, that's a really good question. And I think it gets to one of the, the core issues that we don't talk about enough, but is critically important, which is the question of motivations, right? And people like Andrew Carnegie and um, the funders of large observatories in the 19th century, Lick being one of the most interesting examples, actually, uh, Lick was the richest man in California in the 1870s, and he left 18, sorry, 17.5 percent of his entire estate to a single project, which is now the Lick Observatory um, above San Jose. And his motivations uh, were twofold. Um, his motivation was to have a legacy. Uh, he wanted to have a, a monument to, to uh, his life on Earth, and he's buried underneath the observatory, one of the unique facts about that particular location. Um, the other motivation was that he had this great, great quote um, that was from a friend that uh, said that, you know, at some point it's going to be as common for interorbital travel as it is to walk down Market Street in San Francisco. And this was a view that he had in the 1870s, and so he thought that this was one way to contribute to that future. Well, okay. Fast forward to today where you have people like Elon Musk or Robert Bigelow who are investing hundreds of millions of dollars in these projects. Now, these people have made money elsewhere. And a lot of people will tell you, it's an old joke, but I'll tell it again if you haven't heard it. Um, the easiest way to become uh, you know, a millionaire in the space industry is to start being a billionaire, right? <laughs> the point being that there are a lot easier ways to make money than working in the space industry, as many, many, many startup companies have found out, um, which are no longer here. Um, and if you listen to Elon Musk, if you listen to what he says, what he says is something that's really actually kind of outside of the norm of the usual corporate culture. What he says is that his motivations for starting SpaceX um, is because he wishes to make humanity a multi-planetary species and to uh, set up a new place for humanity on Mars. Now, for me, that is an intrinsic personal motivation. And if you know the history of how Elon got into funding SpaceX, he actually first went to Russia to dr try and buy a launch vehicle so he could launch a greenhouse to Mars as a, as, a, as a statement of the potential. And he just simply found that working with the Russians, you know, the price for the launch vehicle changed depending on how much vodka had happened. This was not a professional um, place to do commercial business. And he said that has to change if we're going to move to Mars. So he started SpaceX. So you tell me, is that a for-profit motivation or are other things driving him? And, and he is trying to make a profit because that allows him to have a sustainable business and to achieve his intrinsic motivations. So now the question is about what types of strategies and tactics are relevant for achieving particular intrinsic motivations. And that's something that's going to take a long time for anyone to, to think through. <laughs>